I'll be the one if you want me to. Anywhere I would have followed you. Say something, I'm giving up on you. And I am feeling so small. It was over my head. I know nothing at all. Many of you here today know what it feels like to be given up on. And even to give up on someone else. For some of you, this experience happened a long time ago. You don't think about it much anymore. And for others, it was recent enough that you still live with the intense pain every single day. There may be some of you in this room this morning who are there right now where you've given up. Whatever the relationship is, you have given up. And the person even maybe sitting next to you may know this or they may not. And for me, this has been the most difficult moment of this entire series as I've thought about it for six weeks now and prayed about it. How, how do we communicate and talk about this idea of no matter how your relationship, your marriage may be or may feel, say something. Do something. Don't let that continue to exist like that. I have a, a friend, and, and he has one of those uncanny abilities to just sort of cut through all the garbage and get right to the point. And I was having a conversation with him during the season for Bethany and I, where I just, I started to become aware that things were just not good. And his advice basically boiled down to this. He said, say something. Rob, I mean, if, if things aren't good, if things are difficult now, what's really to risk? Because 
If, if things are broken and you say something, at least then you have the chance of something better again. And so what I did is, is I mustered up all the courage that I could. And I said something. Now, if, if you have been in an unhealthy marriage or, or have one of those sort of things that continues to be something in your marriage and relationship you deal with over and over and over again and it just seems like you ne can never get past it, you have these conversations once or twice a year, right? And, and they're awful and afterwards it, it's just you feel emotionally spent and so I did that. I said something. I, I, I risked it. I, I went for it. And when I got through to the other side, I lost the courage to continue saying something. Because I just wanted peace. Because peace seemed better than that awful struggle. And just to be completely honest, I was exhausted. I was tired. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to say. But, but in, in being honest about this, the same thing happened that always happens when you stop saying something. It gets worse. And for us, things got worse. And things didn't get better until we got to the point where they were so bad that we not only said something, but we kept saying something. And and it's even worse than that because when we started working on it, and, and this may be you today, you may be here, and there may be just that last little glimmer of something that causes you to say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it one more shot. And, and so um, the problem with that is this. As soon as we really started working on it, things went from bad to worse. And it felt like they, they kept getting worse and worse and worse but we kept saying something and fighting and working. And eventually, one day, about three or four months down the road, we emerged from our brokenness in a better place. But we had to say something. So if you're here today, I want you to hear this. Say something. Keep saying something. Don't let the brokenness go unspoken. And I don't mean yell or fight. I mean say something. Speak out in love. Let your heart break before your spouse. Have the courage to, to risk and to dare and believe that, that there can be something better. And if you're the other person, if you're the one who has been saying something and trying and continuing to say something, and, and yet... There's nothing coming back, and you're on, at the place. Maybe you feel like you're even beyond this, where you're like, I've already given up, or I'm giving up, or I'm in the process. You know what? Have the courage to believe that God can still redeem, that God can make something better. And so, Father, today, I want to pray that, that you would help us. God, help us to be a people no matter where we are in our relationships, God, no matter where we are in our marriage, if we're married, help us to be a people who are filled with hope and faith, who have the courage to, to speak, and God, who have the courage to believe that, that no matter where things are, they can be better. And so, God, we simply want to give you this time, and we want to recognize your presence here in this place. And God, even, even if things are so broken, we don't think we can fix them. God, we look to you this morning knowing that you can fix anything and everything. So God, we ask that you would do that for us today. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to talk to you guys today about oneness. And I want to share with you uh, some interesting math, if I can. Um, and the reason the math is interesting is because it's really difficult math to believe and even more difficult math to live. So let me show the equation. The equation is simple. 1 plus 1 
equals 1. Now, the interesting thing, this is the only week in this whole series that I really struggled with the title, and we were talking about it in a program meeting one week, and, and Pastor Jeremy, ex-math teacher, is the one who came up with this title, all right? So, so it must be right if a, if a high school math teacher said that this was the equation. So, so even if you, here in this place you're like, okay, I can buy into this, or I believe this idea of oneness, of my relationship with my spouse isn't supposed to equal two, it's supposed to equal one, and we're supposed to have this togetherness in this unity. Even if you believe that, the problem is, is that it's hard to live, isn't it? And the reason that it's hard to live, very simply, is because we're selfish. Because the thing that trips us up is that I want what I want. And we all do this, don't we? So, so let me ask you this. Don't raise your hand, especially if they're sitting beside you. Um, but have you ever been married to somebody who everyone else thinks is a saint? And you're like, what? Like, I live with, I can tell you stories, right? Um, I can see some of you looking at each other in ways that, that may make things uncomfortable in here. Um, but, but it happens that way, right? Because when, when we only interact with each other in limited ways, we see the best in others. And when we live together, especially over a period of time, we don't just see the best, we see everything. And so that can be a problem. And so when you refuse to say something when you refuse to, to continue to work on your relationships and when you're on the verge of giving up or you've even given up, what you're really saying is, I am tired. Or I can't keep doing this or even I deserve better. Which, in essence, you're embracing the opposite of what you stood before God and vowed. Do you remember that? Here's what I said to my bride 17 and a half years ago. I, Rob, take you, Bethany, to be my wedded wife, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer. Every time I do a wedding, I almost always want to say for poorer, for poorer. Um, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish till death do us part, according to God's holy law. And thereto I pledge you my faith. See, whether things are great or whether we are just barely hanging on, till death do us part. Right? And it doesn't matter where on that spectrum we are. And as a matter of fact, I just want to say this. If you ever come and sit with me, um, I will never encourage anyone to ever give up on their marriage. I will never do it. I don't care what um, circumstances have been a part of that. I don't even care if you come to me with your Bible wide open and point to a verse and say, See there, I have grounds to do this. Because if you care that much about the scriptures and about what God says, then you would fight for that marriage with everything you had in you. Till death do us part, no matter what. So as, as we think about this interesting math and about oneness, I just want to make some statements today that, that I hope will be helpful for us not just to think about oneness, but to experience oneness as well. And will help us to say something and, and not to give up. So the first thing is pretty obvious, is this. Oneness is work. Now, for this one in particular, can I get an amen on that one? Amen. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Whoa. <laughs> Do we need to pray more for you? Okay. When I was a kid, I had this broken idea. I don't know if you guys felt this way as well. I remember from sort of my child uh, vantage point, looking at adults I knew, and in my mind, I thought that as I grew, life would get easier, right? Because as a kid, life is so hard, right? 
I mean, other people like pay for the roof that's over your head and feed you every single day and buy you clothes, even if they're not exactly the ones you want. And, and you think, man, one of these days when I'm doing it on my own, life is going to be easier. And then we grow up a little bit and we realize life isn't easier at all. And in fact, it gets harder and it gets to be more work. I actually met with a young couple recently who were high school sweethearts, and they're not too far past that now. And it was interesting just as we talked and as they were noticing how things weren't as easy, and they were only just a little bit older because, because life happens, doesn't it? And we have life to contend with. And, uh, and I don't know about you, but when I go home, it doesn't matter how tired I am, or it doesn't matter how long my day has been. If Christopher, my eight-year-old son, is awake, none of that stuff enters his mind. And he's like, Daddy, can we play? And I have a choice to make. I have a choice to make to let all the life that crashes in cause me to, to speak harshly to him or say, Christopher, just leave me alone. I've got a headache and I need, to, I need to relax. Or I can get on the ground and play with him. Right? And the exact same thing is true with my marriage in, in that part of my life. Because every day, I don't just have to battle my selfishness. I have to battle my exhaustion. And I'm confronted with the massive amount of work that oneness requires. Check out this quote. Love is hard work. It is, in fact, the hardest work of all. And no partner is ever allowed a vacation. Isn't that good? Love is hard work. It is, in fact, the hardest work work of all. And none of us are ever allowed a vacation from this idea of working on the oneness in our marriage. It's just, we're not allowed. We can take a vacation from almost everything else in life, but working on the oneness that God wants us to have in our marriages is never an option. This is unending work that seems to increase, not decrease. The older we get, the more we're doing, the more we're thinking about the work increases, it doesn't decrease. The only thing that really changes is whether or not we're doing the work in the context of joy or not, right? Because you've seen this, where you're sort of doing things for each other, kind of grumbling under your breath or begrudging the other, or when you're doing it because you really love each other and you're happy to do it. I remember it. It was a while ago now, but it wasn't that long ago. When I was in college, I would have spent every penny in my bank account to create a beautiful experience for my wife. I just would have done it. And it doesn't take long for things to drastically change, does it? Because we get so worried about so many other things. In fact, I have a story from yesterday about how this is true and how love is work and oneness is work. So yesterday, Bethany was invited out. Okay, so the, it's the, you know, come hang out, mom of a six-week-old, um, <laughs> come hang out with adults for uh, a few hours. And so she says, hey, is it cool if I go out? Um, now, I just want to say, do you know how much work a baby is? And, and, and I'm just going to be honest about my own brokenness. I'm not saying that from my wife's perspective, who that's her full-time job. I'm saying that from my perspective, who's thinking about looking after a baby all by myself for four hours. I know, it seems, it seems broken, but, but I'm thinking about it like that. And, and, and not, you guys, you can say amen to help me if you want to. Thank, thank you. Thanks, Andy. Thanks for throwing yourself out under the bus like that for my, my sake. Um, and not only that, but something you may not be as aware of is, do you know how much energy it takes to be a pastor on Saturday? Now, here's what I mean by that. For me, Sunday's easy. I, I love being up here. I love being here with you guys. I love worshiping God. I love interacting. I love talking. All that stuff feeds me, gives me energy, gives me life. I don't think twice about this. The hard part is Saturday, all day long, from the time I get up in the morning to the time I go to bed and sort of fitfully sleep through the night. I'm thinking about all the stuff 
that, that God has been saying and I've been studying for weeks to get ready for Sunday. And, and I, I'm hopefully thinking about it in ways that make sense and are clear. And all day long, Saturday is the most exhausting day of the week for me. And it's largely mental. And I hate being bugged on Saturday. And, uh, and my wife even offered not to go. Now, there was part of me that wondered if she would have done so if she thought that I'd say no. But you know what? I actually think that, that she still would have said that. And the reason that I think that is because right now, I think we're doing a pretty decent job, even in the chaos of a six-week-old, of trying to have each other's best in mind. So whether that's her being up most of the night with a baby, or whether that's me doing a four-hour tour of duty um, on a day that my mind really could be used in other ways, I love my wife, and I want her to have space, and I want her to come home being excited to see me. And so we get to do these things for each other. We get to work in the context of joy, and it makes it a lot better. It's way better to work for oneness in that sort of environment than any others. The second thing I want to say about oneness is this. Oneness is wonderful. It's absolutely incredible. There is nothing better than oneness. Some of you guys have asked about my shirt over the last number of weeks. It says oneness. And then underneath it says, I love my wife. Um, Woohoo! Some of you have asked about wanting to buy one of these. And I want you to know um, that the experience is way better than the shirt. All right? Uh, buying the shirt is easy. Doing the work is not. And so all the things we tend to look at in our relationships that we think are the things that sabotage oneness. Sometimes people in relationships overspend like crazy and get a family into trouble. Sometimes there's issues of infidelity where people are fooling around. Even things... Believe it or not, this might sound silly, but even things like people chronically overeating. A lot of times we, we see those things, and, and I want you to know this. Many times these things are nothing more than symptoms of a lack of oneness. Because the thing that God has designed for us, that he wants us all to have, when we're not experiencing oneness, we do all kinds of really weird, selfish, unhealthy things to try to fill that void that God wants to be filled with oneness. And, and I feel for Bethany and I, I feel like we have more oneness now, and my marriage is more valuable now, because I've had to fight for it. Because I've actually had to work for it. And so I would say, if you think to yourself that your, your marriage is wonderful, you guys have oneness, but you've never had to work for it, and you've never had to fight for it, I would say, unless you're just married, that's pretty cheap, and it's not really oneness yet. Y you need to wrestle a little bit more, and work a little bit harder, and it'll become so much more valuable. So for any of you who are here today and, and you're in that place where you feel like you're on the, the verge or you're even over the edge and you're thinking to yourself, well, I get that oneness is wonderful and, and I want oneness. It, it, it makes sense. Um, and, and I get that it's work, but you're wondering if you should put the work in because in your relationship, you just don't think it could go anywhere. And for you, I want you to hear this today. Oneness is worth it. It's worth it. It's always 100% worth it. It's worth it no matter how hopeless you feel in your current relationship. Um, it's always this way. And if for no other reason, when you fight for something, it increases in value. Now, some of you might think, well, wait a minute, Rob. You've told us some of the ways that you and Bethany struggled or were broken. And come on, that, that's not as real as what I'm experiencing right? Uh, we actually have big problems, and your problems were small. Well, let me just tell you this. I don't care if your problem's big or small. If you have it, it's just as real, okay? Um, if it's creating division, it's just as real. And in terms of a problem being big or small, I would say largely that's irrelevant, 
It, it doesn't matter the size of the problem. What matters is the lack of togetherness. And, and if for no other reason, here is why it's worth it to work on this. Focus on the Family uh, put out a study recently, a very recent study, and they, they showed that in almost every case across the board, when, when a couple who was in a bad marriage decided to, to work on it, to say something, to engage and to work on it, five years later, almost 100% of them were in a better place than if they had gotten out of the marriage and started over. Uh, almost 100%. So you may be asking yourself why, and I think there's a few reasons why. I think that the, the problem is... Um, we almost always think it, it, it's less about us than it really is. And, and that kind of goes like this. Um, you know, there's two ingredients, and it's really the other ingredient's fault. This lazy, good-for-nothing person that you, you put me with, God, um, they're the problem. And so if we just remove the problem, if we remove that ingredient and put some nice, new, cute ingredient in with us, Things will be better. And if you've ever been to counseling, any counselor worth anything will tell you that you can't change anyone. That you can only change yourself. And that when you start changing yourself, when you become a better ingredient, when you become the kind of ingredient that God wants you to be, guess what? The whole chemistry of the dish changes. And just by you being a different ingredient and better ingredient, the other ingredient can't help but change as well. So I, I think that's unbelievable. A lot of times we, we just, we always want to blame it. And so what happens is we leave one marriage, one relationship, we go to the next, and they may not be there anymore. But guess who is? <laughs> I'm there. And I create way more problems than I think that I do in relationships. And so do you. And your spouse can say amen now. <laughs> okay, maybe not. The other reason why I think this happens is this. It's harder to live with somebody than we think it is. Uh, we were hanging out with a couple not too long ago. And uh, um, the spouse, the, the wife said this. If my spouse dies, I am remaining alone. Now, this, this lady loves her husband, absolutely loves her husband, but that was not said out of deep love for her husband. That was said out of, it's hard enough to figure out how to live with one dude, and I don't want to have to go through that process ever again. Right? It's hard to live with somebody. It's hard to, to figure out and wrestle through all the differences and intricacies and communication issues and all that stuff. This is not easy. And the more we do it and the longer we do it, again, the, the harder the work becomes. And the last thing I, I'd say as to why uh, this is true is we, we don't take what we've learned in one relationship to the next relationship. And here's what I mean by that. Um, a lot of times in the office here, and not just a st uh, statistical way, but in a practical way, um, it's not uncommon to talk to someone uh, or even a couple people who have been divorced and now they're dating and they love each other and they want to get married. And we're like, great, hey, we sort of do premarital counseling first. And they're like, oh, no, no, we figured it out. You know, we, we've already made all the mistakes and now we've learned and so we figured it out and we're good. And it's like, no, it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. And in fact, statistically, um, the divorce rate for first marriages is really high. And then the divorce rate for second marriages jumps up about 10 percentage points higher. And then for third, it, go, it continues to go up. Why is that? Because we come and we think, well, I made all the mistakes. I, I, I've learned. I know better. But we don't take those things and bring them with us as helpful learning. If anything, what happens is, we, we can have a broken picture from maybe what we saw in our home growing up. But man, if you've, if you've been in bad relationships or, or a marriage that's ended, guess what? You bring forward more broken pictures and more broken habits and practices. And not even that, here, here's what happens too. Um, when you get with a new person, 
You have to communicate with them and get to know them all over again from the very beginning. So again, you, you don't bring what you have, what you've learned. You have to start all over again. And you don't want to do that. Nobody wants to do that. Sometimes we're deceived in the thinking that we do, but you don't. And then let me say this. Oneness is waiting for you. It's God's design for you in so many ways, in so many areas of life. Just like I had it, and I lost it, and I have it again. And so let's see what the scripture has to say about oneness and unity. And to do that, we're going to start in Ephesians chapter 4. So the Bible says this. Paul says, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Just some things I want you to see here. I love the words. What does he say first? I urge you, right? This isn't just a good suggestion or a helpful hint. Paul here is like, no, no, this is so important. This is way more important than you even know. And what does he urge them? He says, be completely humble. What would it look like in your marriage if you were completely humble? Huh? And, and then be completely gentle. Be completely patient. And then bear with each other, no matter how difficult it is, bear with each other how? In love. And then I love that last little bit. Seek unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Unity comes through and by the Spirit of God, not by better performance. If you want to be closer to anyone, you want to be closer to your spouse, you need God's Spirit. It's not just you behaving better and better and better and then hopefully perfectly. <laughs> that just doesn't happen. All the women should say amen. All right? Um, it doesn't work that way. We need the Spirit of God. We need God's presence in our lives and in our relationships for this to happen. Then the passage continues. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So as we think about this idea of unity, hear this, there's only one. This is God's design for what we're supposed to experience in his church. Hey, have you ever noticed when there's more than one, we start, to, we start to struggle, we start to get selfish? You know, when there's ten, we go, maybe I could just have four. This is the problem with these dumb shows like The Bachelor and The Bachelorette. Right? Come on, I know, I know a lot of you watch it. And, uh, and I'm not even judging you for watching it. It's the problem with the show, though. Because you start to watch it, and you're like, oh, man. I mean, if, if you could take her intelligence and her personality and her looks, right? If, if we could just go to Build-A-Bear to make our spouse. <laughs> Woo! See, do you see the problem? But that's not how it works. It doesn't work like that. And even the person maybe you, you see or you know, and you're like, oh, they're just exactly. No, they're not. Because your spouse was exactly like you thought, or, you know, it, was, it was, isn't just like you thought when you first met them either, right? And, and so we want to pick and choose. And it doesn't work like that when there's only one Things are, are better. When there's one God, we have unity there. And when we realize the person we're with is the only one, that is better. Pastor Jeremy shared this a couple times in staff recently. A quote he found, Comparison kills contentment. The more we have to compare, the more we let ourselves compare, it kills our contentment. There's just one. And then the passage continues, but each one of us, but to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. 
Hear this. Jesus has given us what we need. More personally, if you hear nothing else today, Jesus has given you what you need. See, Jesus knows your circumstance. He knows where you are in life right now. He knows the struggles you experience in your relationships. And what the passage here is telling us is, is however much, whatever portion of grace that we need from him to get through that and to survive that and to get to a better place and a healthier place, whatever gifts we need in order to be successful wherever we find ourselves, he knew that perfectly about you and he gave that to you. That's incredibly good news. The passage continues like this. What does he ascended mean except he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave us the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers. And then it continues to equip his people for what? Works. Of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we reach all unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So, if we want to get there, if we really want to, to attain the full measure of the fullness of Christ, some interesting words there, right? Work. Right? God gave us all the people, all the tools, all that we needed, and then our job is to work. There, there's works that need to be done. And, and these works um, lead to maturity. We don't just pop out mature. We have to work to get there. And, and we take what God has given us and we build. We build to this place. We work to get there. And if we want to get there, The thing that's required more than anything else is unity, the text says, in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God. The thing that gets us there, the thing that helps us to mature and experience unity is being together in our faith and being together in our knowledge of who Jesus is, having that shared experience. The text continues, Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching, and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. So what the scripture here is saying is, don't be infants, right? Stop being childish. Don't be tossed like this. Instead, be mature. This is what God wants for us. Don't be, don't be one, the one who is always watching for the other one to slip up. Oh, 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 I, you know, I had my eye on you and I knew you were going to fail at that again. Don't be that person. Instead, allow the love of God, the incredible love of God, to fill you and overflow into your other relationships and to overcome and cover over the silly, stupid things we all struggle with instead of nitpicking them all the time. Nitpick them, see if they get better. Love the person with the love of God and see if that doesn't change them, because it will. And then the passage ends like this. Instead... Speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of Jesus, who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So speak the truth in love. This is telling us we need to communicate in love. Don't yell. Don't just fight or argue. Speak, communicate in love. When you build, how should you build? Build in love. And in the things that, that you know and you experience, you need to know and experience the love of Jesus, who is the one who makes it all work anyway. You don't make it work. I wish you, I wish you could. I wish I could. But he's the one who holds it all together. So what about for those of you who have given up? You've moved on. You've experienced a door that's totally closed. Well, let me tell you that that with that in mind, 
oneness can be yours again. Now, don't twist this. If you're here today and you're like, Rob, I'm really glad you said that. Because my husband or wife who I'm married to, who I've given up on, and we're just, we're not even hanging real on anymore, really. Um, I'm glad you said this, because I have deep faith that I can have oneness again down the road with somebody else. If you're married and are thinking that, um, I just want you to know that I am not saying that, and God isn't either. In fact, what I'm saying and what God wants you to know is that you can have oneness again. It's waiting for you right where you are. In the relationship you are in, just like I, it, it's been mine again, just like it's been Bethany's again, just like many of you have experienced this. You didn't have it. You lost it. You were, you were hopeless and things are better or things are good. Just like you've experienced this, God can do this for you. Because God is not, it's not only his design for the church that there be oneness and unity, this is God's design for your life and your family and most importantly, your marriage. But we have some stuff that messes with that. So I want you to check out this video for a second. Oneness could be yours again. Do you think you'd have more of that if you treated your significant other with all the things that were on that list? In those ways? Would you have oneness more right now? Genesis 2.24 says it this way. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. God's ultimate desire for you from the very beginning was not just that you wouldn't be alone, but also that you would be one. It's not good enough if, if you're just married. It's not good enough to simply live under the same roof. You need to be one. And if you are not one, you need to fight for that more than anything. Say something. Don't give up. Proverbs 18.24 builds on it by saying this. One who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. That word sticks in the Hebrew is the exact same word in Genesis 2.24 where it says, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united or be joined to his wife. And the two will become one. So the picture here is that the only person, the only friend who can be closer than that one flesh relationship we're supposed to experience with our spouse is Jesus. He's the only one. And the subtle inference here is this, and, and this is unbelievably important. If we want true oneness, if we want lasting oneness, Jesus is a necessary component for that. You cannot have it without him. I need God. You need God. We're really good at in, inviting him and invoking him, oh God, please, please come. But we're really bad at actually listening to him, aren't we? And we're really, you know, he says, great, now do this and do this. We're like, oh, no, 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 I just need you to swoop down and fix it. And we're really bad at allowing him, allowing him to do what he wants, allowing him, waiting for him to give us the relationships that he wants. Some of you maybe are here today and you're like, you know, I'm single and I'm lonely. Well, let me just say I get it. But you don't need another quick relationship. What you need is to start with Jesus. Have a relationship with Jesus. Talk to Jesus. Get to know Jesus and wait for him to give you the person he wants you to have. For some of you, you're here today and you're like, you know what? I'm divorced and I'm broken. And, and I've been so broken, I might as well just continue to live broken. Let me tell you, God can fix that. He can repair that. You need God, not brokenness, not other things like that. Some of you are here today, and you're saying, I'm married, but I don't know that this marriage could ever be fixed. Well, I think that if you feel that way, your marriage probably can't be fixed by you, because if it could, you probably would have fixed it by now but you need God because Jesus can fix your marriage no matter where it is, no matter how broken it is. Jesus can fix that. 
He can make the difference. He is the path to unity, whether we have another part yet or not. It's the picture of the hinge. I actually took this off a door in my house this morning. Um, This is a marvel, isn't it? That two pieces of metal can hold hundreds of pounds and operate smoothly. And, and it's so important. And it doesn't matter if, if the pieces of metal are perfect and true. And it doesn't matter if they line up perfectly. Many of us have felt that, right? Oh, I just love you and we're so perfect together. It doesn't matter if, if the, the holes are cut perfectly on the door and on the jam where it's affixed to. If there's not what? If there's not the pin. If you don't have the pin, it doesn't matter how great these things are. And let me tell you this today. I'm not just here. Some of you are going, Rob, we like the first three weeks way better. We could identify with being lonely, and we could identify with us screwing up, and we just need to do better. Um, You like that better than the whole idea of Jesus is the only answer? If there was any other way, if there was any five easy or hard steps, I would give them to you. I wouldn't hold out on you. But in my own life, and in my own marriage, and in my own brokenness, it was none of those steps that helped as much as Jesus. And so even if everything else is perfect, without this, it doesn't take too many swings for there to be catastrophic failure. And so, Father, this morning, we want to say before we say anything to anybody, our spouse or anyone else, we want to say something to you. Jesus, we want to say that we need you. Whether our relationships are good, whether our relationships are okay, whether our relationships seem past the point of no return, Jesus, we say, that we need you in our lives and in our relationships. God, it may be something totally different. It may not be a relationship at all. And Jesus, we still say that we need you. It could be that we've lost somebody and we're still just overcome with the grief of that. And in that moment, Jesus, we say that we need you. If there's anyone here this morning, and I don't care if your relationship is great, or horrible, or maybe you don't even have a relationship. But maybe for some of you here in this place this morning, you would say, I have never, ever even said, Jesus, I need you. You've never made Jesus the pin. You've never invited him to be Lord and Savior of your life. And maybe this morning, for the first time ever, you've come to that point, or would like to say that. If there's anyone here who just wants to communicate that to God without anyone looking around, If you just want to slip up your hand, if you would do that, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I need you in my relationship. Jesus, I need you in my life. Is there anyone? I can see that. Anyone else? Jesus, I I need you. I've been trying on my own. I've been using my strength, and it hasn't worked. It hasn't been enough. And so, Father, this morning, we want oneness. We want to be close to the people close to us. But Jesus, help us to see and know that that doesn't happen without you. You are the path to that. And so this morning, we just thank you so much that you love us, that we can say something we don't have to give up, and you are always there to lead us and guide us if we will only turn to you. We thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. to
follow you this morning, that you're here with us. In this very room, you're here. You're not a God who sits on a throne, distant from your children. You send your spirit to be in us and with us, a constant connection with you. And we are so grateful, God, that you don't give up on us in those moments in our lives where we may have even given up on ourselves. You don't give up on us. Your word in Isaiah says that we shall be called sought out a city not forsaken. Thank you. Thank you for chasing after us with reckless abandon. We are your beloved, and you are ravished by one look of our eyes, one glance in your direction, one turn of our hearts. Help us to turn our hearts to you in a new way today, to surrender those pieces of ourselves that we've been holding back, to know that you are trustworthy with them. We are not forsaken. You are with us, and we love you. And I know you're with me. Yes, I know you're with me here. And I know your love will last. And I know you're with me. Yes, I
want you to know that I don't care what we have to do or who we have to tick off. I will do absolutely everything as long as I'm here to help us in our marriages and in our church to experience oneness. There's nothing more important. So I don't know what that next step is for you. For some of you, it may just be a commitment to, to keep coming back and, and being in God's presence and, and hearing truth. For some of you, it, it could be getting plugged in with a small group. We've heard incredible stories over these last number of weeks how people's lives and marriages are being changed just as they interact in those transformational small group settings. For some of you, maybe grabbing one of the folders and signing up for the Art of Marriage, even if your marriage is great, just as a way to say, we need to keep working on this and investing in what God has given us. Just like you had to drive through the snow apocalypse or snowmageddon to get here today, um, the same is true in your marriages. Exact same thing. It's not easy. Things are slippery sometimes. You, you know, you got to fight to stay on the road. But it's worth it. And you got to keep fighting. And as long as you're fighting, you don't have to do it with your own strength or your own love. The love of God, the strength of God is there to guide the way. So church, as we leave from this place today, <laughs> you may slip off the road. But man, in your marriage, in your home, in your key relationships... Love each other with the love of God and watch how that changes everything. It's great to have you guys here today.